Good evening and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Isabel Lilias and I'm one of the Ath Fellows this year. It's no secret that most great works of art have religious content. Their shared transcendent, imaginative, and evocative qualities make them quite the pairing. One powerful similarity that they share is the strength of the voice in both these realms. Whether you define voice as the literal literal sounds and words that make up songs or ideas, or the didactic guiding perspective that points the follower or listener to a meaning or message that goes beyond the words themselves. The voice in both religion and art offer an understanding of our world and our lives that exceeds the physical human experience. Mirabai is, a well -known, is the most well-known of the women Hindu saints of India. According to tradition, the 16th century royal devotee of Krishna was born in the kingdom of Marwar and dedicated to Krishna from childhood. She married into the royal family, but refused to behave as a woman of her class, as a woman of her class was required to do, and instead fearlessly danced and sang for her lord in the public space of the temple and kept company with holy men and people from all walks of life. Though there were attempts to stop her, and to kill her for these transgressions, she departed to become a wandering religious leader, traveling to holy places associated with Krishna. She is known not only for her story, but also for the devotional songs of love and longing she is said to have composed. Our speaker tonight will explore how regular people participate in co-creating the voice of Mirabai, highlighting marginalized speech excluded from the Hindi literary canon of her works. Nancy Martin is Chair and Associate Professor of Religious Studies and Director of Schweitzer Institute at Chapman University and Life Member of Clare Hall, University of Cambridge. She received her MA from the University of Chicago and her PhD in Comparative Religion from Graduate Theological Union. Professor Martin is recognized for both her expertise on devotional Hinduism and for her work in comparative religious ethics. A leading authority on the woman Saint Mirabai, her publications also explore multiple dimensions of the Bhakti path and address issues of gender, religious identity, and communal relations in India. As the co-founder and co-director of the Global Ethics and Religion Forum from 2001 to 2009, she also organized a series of conferences and programs internationally, examining major ethical challenges from diverse religious perspectives, and she has edited and she has edited a series of volumes on related, these related topics. Professor Martin's Athenaeum presentation is co-sponsored by the Cutton Lectureship in Religious Studies at Claremont McKenna College. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. Please silence and put away your mobile devices at this time. And please join me in welcoming Professor Martin to the Athenaeum. Okay, I was going to start by giving you a little background on Mira, and you just heard a little bit of it, for those of you who aren't entirely familiar with her. But let me show you, offer you a few illustrations of this story of who she is, because the story is really important to understanding her voice as well. Um, the stories about her begin with her devotion from childhood, which is a popular characteristic of all women's hagiographies in India, the stories of women saints. They all supposedly start this early in childhood. Um, this, these are pictures from a 2009 television serial about Mira's life. So she's popular today, even though she dates back to the 16th century. She remains very popular. She's known for her incredible devotion to Krishna. And these are illustrations from her hometown of Merta in the kingdom of Marwar. Um, different ways of conceiving of her. The, the far one here is from a comic book version of her life. So she's everywhere, film, comic books, television, novels, museums, um, much earlier paintings as well. There were attempts to kill her. The person who tried to kill her generally is referred to as the Rana, the king, it's a specific name for the king of of Marwa, or Mewar, into which she was married in a marriage of political alliance, most people say against her will. Um, 
and her in-laws tried to kill her. Some stories say it was her father-in-law or a brother-in-law, but most of them say it was her husband. They try to poison her because she's doing things that a woman of her caste and class should not be doing, like dancing and singing in the temple in public, hanging out with men not of her family, holy men, but still, and people of all walks of life. Um, they try other methods to kill her as well, snakes in a basket that are cobras. Told, she's told that there are garlands to put around her Krishna image. At one point, her husband, the Rana, uh, sends some spies who hear her in her chamber talking as if she's speaking to a lover, and he goes in with his sword held high, ready to kill her. But when he opens the door, she's there alone with her image of Krishna. According to some stories, he sees four images of Mira and can't figure out which one to kill, so uh, kind of takes all the, the wind out of his anger. In other stories, he sees Mira's image of Krishna reach out and move a game piece on the Parcheesi board that they're playing, and he just backs away in uh, total unbelievability. But he doesn't kill her. She doesn't die in these accounts. She manages to survive despite all of this, and eventually she leaves her home in Mewar, her in-laws, and she becomes a wandering saint. Um, these are pictures from 1940, uh, by Kanu Desai. Um, she leaves and she goes to Vrindavan, according to some stories, and when exactly she goes, the stories are all different, so that's part of the issue. Um, a, a talk for another day. But she goes at some point to Vrindavan, they say, and she meets a great religious teacher there. Generally, it's Jeev Goswami. Sometimes it's said to be Rup Goswami, a leader of the Gaudiya Sampradai who refuses to see her initially because she's a woman and he doesn't talk to women until she reminds him that everyone, all souls are women, are female in the presence of the male divine. And indeed, in the presence of the female divine, they also have to be female. We'll come back to that. Eventually, she becomes, um, she's taken up, she's in film. This is Subalakshmi in a very famous film made in 1945 in Tamil in 1947 in Hindi, right on the cusp of independence. Um, and she becomes a cultural heroine. All right, let me see if I can find where I come back to my text. Okay, some will try to make her devotion the outcome of loss. Oh, I forgot one more thing. She merges with the image of Krishna. In, after Vrindavan, she goes to another holy city associated with Krishna, um, Dwarka, where Krishna is said to establish his kingdom later. She merges with his image there. Um, achieving an inseparable union with her Lord, as well as finally escaping the grasp of the honor-bound Sasodhya Rajputs of Mewar, who would take her back to Chittor. Some will try to make her devotion the outcome of loss, including the death of her husband, her departure the equivalent of a widow's renunciation, and her tormentor a despicable brother-in-law. But however her life is told, she remains a figure of fearlessness, absolute dedication, and unshakable devotion. Hindu nationalists would lift her up as an example of the strength of Indian women, and India is a place where such women could flourish. And also as the first Hindi poetess, as the modern language of Hindi was carved out of the dense linguistic weave of North India. But to do so would require that she be recast as an ideal wife, a pativrata, who never con contradicted her husband while he was alive. <clears throat> She would serve as Gandhi's premier example to motivate women to fearless nonviolent resistance, and M.S. Subalakshmi's film would be on the cusp of independence and cement her place as a pan-Indian cultural heroine. Yet an ambivalence attends her. No religious sect ever developed around her, as they did around other saints like Nanak Kabir and Raidas, nor would songs in her name be formally incorporated into the literary canons of any sampradaya or institutional teaching lineage as the aforementioned saints' songs were into the Sikh Guru Granth, and Surdas was as one of the astachaps of the Vallabha Pushtimar. Now, despite over, nor despite overwhelming attempts to do so, could she be narratively confined to the role of the good wife, as nationalists would have it, or to a childlike or even childish exceptionalism, as comic books, novels, films, and television serials have done in the latter half of the 20th century. Her story can always be retold, and is, in ways that portray the suffering endured, 
and perpetuated by caste, gender, and economic impression, oppression, and that inspire fierce resistance and joyous dignity rather than compliance and acquiescence. It is Mirabai's songs that are the primary focus of my presentation tonight, but it is essential that we know something also of her life because it makes all the difference in the world that it is this very particular woman who sings them. She is, in a sense, a character interior to the meaning of the song as its singer. But here, too, things are not quite what they seem at first glance. There are standard written sources for literary story, study of her collected works, most notably the evolving collection assembled by Par Parashuram Chaturvedi and translated in full into English by A.J. Alston. These are backed by Lalit Prasad Shukul's claims of early manuscript origins. Yet when we try to locate copies of these manuscripts, they are nowhere to be found. And thus, this official Hindi literary canon has no legitimate claim to record Mira's direct speech. Indeed, her songs are sung most commonly in jagrans, the all-night singing sessions that remain the most popular form of religious gathering in India, where they, are, they come alive in the voices of men and women and people of every class, caste, and background, with many of the songs sung here explicitly excluded from the literary canon or sung in different forms. But first, we must ask, when we listen to Mira's songs today or read those documented in manuscripts and print, what are we actually hearing and reading? Clearly not all the songs sung and written down in her name were composed by a specific 16th century woman named Mirabai, though some number of them indeed may have been, something that scholars have been keenly aware of from the earliest days of the academic study of the saint in the 19th century. There are hundreds, even thousands, that bear her chop or characteristic signature in the final verse, most often as Mira's lord is the gallant mountain, be mountain bearer, Girdar Nagar. Her name inseparable from that of her divine beloved, to a degree quite distinct from other poet saints. Those songs that might have been composed by a specific woman who lived some 500 years ago are inextricably intermixed with other songs composed in her name and style by people in subsequent generations. People both female and male, low caste and high born, in a multitude of times and places, making the authorship of this corpus of songs stubbornly collective. As with the stories told about her, we are faced with a participatory and composite tradition, and now also a language and voice in which other people speak. The body of song that emerges is profoundly intersubjective, co-created by all those who have sung and improvised and innovated in her voice together across the centuries and continue to do so. What traces do we have of Mira's songs from the past? And how close might we be able to get to identifying a set of songs that might actually have been composed by the saint herself? We would certainly like to know firsthand what she had to say about her own life and her Lord, as well as something of the nature of her devotion in her own words and her attitudes and character revealed through her compositions. Then we would be able to analyze how this individual 16th century Rajput woman's mode of expression, experiences, feelings, and spiritual insights might have differed from those of her male contemporaries, for example, or compare her works to those of other women saints in India or in alternate religious traditions, even in distant locales and centuries. Many have engaged in this type of analysis based on the songs attributed to her, but if they're not really her words, what then? Undoubtedly, some of the songs that come down to us were initially composed by such a person, but we are unable to say which ones. And what of the rest? What makes a song Mira's then? And what kinds of conclusions can we draw from such songs? We will need to follow Jack Hawley's lead and shift our focus from authorship to authority. The attribution of a song to Mira anchors it in the well-known stories told of her life. Sung in her name, such a song is not just a unique creation, however beautiful, of an otherwise unknown later individual. The voice which speaks therein instead carries the weight and distinctive tone of a very illustrious and specific person, female, high caste, royal, absolutely devoted, persecuted yet undeterred, called Mira, with the caveat, of course, that people have different ideas of exactly who she was. The first person to sing any given song within the corpus may not be identifiable, 
yet such songs are decidedly not anonymous in the way that folk songs often are. Rather, they speak with a recognizable and beloved voice that first emerges in medieval Rajasthan, with each successive composer or singer being Mirabai in some sense in the moment of singing, so that the past breaks into the present to be experienced as living reality in a way not unlike the specialized actors who are understood to manifest Krishna's eternal leela through dramatic enactment. Attributed to a saintly author like Mira, such a song is also marked as belonging to the wider flow of bhakti and to the currents of familiar poetry and story that swirl around each honored and beloved saint. Waters in which devotees immerse themselves through the sadhana or religious practice of singing and listening. And it shares a network of associations with the voices of other poet saints, voices also initiated by specific individuals, but not silenced by their passing any more than Mira's is. Indeed, the voices swell across the centuries as more and more people perform and compose in the names of the saints participating in a collaborative creation, interpretation, and amplification of speech in these distinct yet sometimes also overlapping saintly voices. And the resulting bodies of song attributed to them reflect a collective and emergent wisdom and experience, artistry and existence. Scholars have struggled with how to speak about these bodies of song, referring to them as the works or tradition of a given saint and to their collective authorship or co-creation by multiple individuals. Even so, it is all too easy to slip back into speaking as if a singular individual were the composer, particularly because those who sing the songs of these saints do so, having little concern for the textual critic's obsession with verifiable individual authorship. The voice of a given saint is recognizable to them, though it may also be contested and vary with different communities, imagined or otherwise, or publics in different times and places. It is a voice understood to be initiated by a known historical individual person, poet devotee, who composed and publicly performed songs that were then picked up and sung by others, with singers equally aware that subsequent individuals have improvised and added to that voice. Striving to characterize the nature of this collective participation, some scholars have suggested that the saint subsequently functions as a rhetorical person a common poetic pseudonym or a discursively constituted mask. Yet it is not just anything that will be spoken of or more importantly, accepted by others as authentic to a given saint's voice. The saint is no mere ventriloquist doll or empty cipher simply to be used at will by subsequent ghost writers. Nor is there necessarily a sense of falsification going on when people compose in the singer's name. To move beyond such implications, Holly joins Prashottam Agrawal in speaking of shared understandings of the particular sensibilities associated with specific saints' voices. But what then is the sensibility that marks songs in Mira's voice, making them readily recognizable as such to any one of her many publics? What does her voice sound like and what does it make possible to say? And further, how do people actually participate in co-authoring this voice and why might they do so? To begin to answer this complex, these complex questions, we'll need to examine the actual songs that carry her name, including, wherever possible, details of their composition and performance, reception, and documentation. We begin to hear of the originator of this particular voice in the latter half of the 16th century. Hari Ram Yas and Anantadas invoke her, but it is Nabadas who first describes Mira's voice around 1600. Without restraint, utterly fearless, her tongue sang the praises of he who knows love's ways. And she did so publicly, beating a drum, disregarding family tradition, and a shame before none. Isolated songs come to us from across the 17th century, revealing this powerful force directly, with more and more songs becoming visible and then audible to us as the centuries passed. Yet even in the these earliest references, distinctive qualities of this particular voice begin to emerge. It is unequivocally the speech of a woman, irrespective of the gender of the performer or composer of a given song attributed to it. Gender is a fluid identity in the samsaric realm of rebirth, shifting across lifetimes in a kind of serial androgyny, as Wendy Doniger puts it. 
Further, in bhakti traditions, a feminine spiritual identity is deemed appropriate for male and female devotees alike in their love of the divine, whether in male for, the male forms of Shiva and Vishnu or his, and his avatars, or in the female form of the Devi. Even Shiva and Vishnu must come to Mahadevi as women to join her intimate circle in the Devi Bhagavata Purana. As Mira's challenged Jeev Goswami illustrates, in Vaishnava traditions, men identify with the enamored women of Krishna's adoptive cowherding community, the gopis, even as women do. And some men go even further in this identification, taking on the outward dress and demeanor of women in Sakibha. Male Vaishnava saints like Surdas speak in their poetry in the voices of women as they explore the multiple dimensions of love, of Krishna's mother, Yashoda, of the gopis, or even of his special lover, Radha, or her girlfriends, the Sakis. But these songs are attributed to male poets, and thus Sur's voice, though it also partakes of a similar participatory and collective nature to Mira's, is tied to his specific story and personality, and is ultimately still recognized as male. Even when used to speak from a woman's point of view, and even if a woman performs or composes in it, it is still identified as the voice of a male saint. In contrast, though we cannot say that all the songs attributed to Mira were composed by a specific woman, or even multiple, but exclusively women, we can say that this voice is understood by all to be a woman's direct speech without the imaginative and emotional distance, however minute, that is opened up when a male speaks as or takes on the persona or even identity of a woman in devotion. It thus constitutes a culturally recognized, authentic female voice, even as it authorizes direct and powerful female speech. Navadas connects Mira's violent persecution directly to her singing, yet he makes it clear that this is a female voice that cannot be silenced or even completely restrained, though many will try. Hers is a voice that speaks aloud in the public square, as Navadas declares, without shame and without fear a voice not of despair or of submission, but rather of love, of longing, of hope, and of challenge. And it is a voice which elicits condemnation and violent opposition by unnamed wicked ones as Navadas judges them. There is a continuing quality of disruptiveness to this woman's voice even as there is to her character. Though both may be deeply loved and admired, an ecstasy articulated therein and an individuality coupled with a transgressive egalitarian solidarity that stands at odds with the constraints of family honor and social convention and the ways of the world. This female voice does not fit easily into the bifurcated view of women as either virtuous or shameful, good or bad in any normative sense, nor is it the wholly other voice of a divine being. Rather, it is a human woman's voice that challenges such a limited view of femaleness and much more generating and actualizing alternate possibilities. A male voice speaking as a gobi does not appear to carry the same danger or evoke the same response, spoken as it is in the space of imagination and in the alternate realm of devotional encounter, of subtle rather than physical bodies and the eternal love play of the inner self and the divine rather than the everyday. But Mira's voice is understood to be a real woman's voice. And herein, it seems, lies the danger, evidenced by the number of attempts to silence or at least con contain its disruptive potential, as well as to employ its powerful appeal. Initiated by an actual woman, this voice moves beyond the boundaries of male imagination and the confines of devotional theology to speak from the subject position of I, disregarding and challenging very real social constraints, even through this simple act of speaking publicly articulating actual defiance, an individual desire, and unmasking violent coercion for what it is. Hers is the voice of a named woman living a physical, gendered life in this world and speaking out of her very real lived experience, including both her unmediated encounter with God and the suffering she endures at the hands of others. Though to be sure there are other women saints whose voices are heard in the canons of bhakti, no other, it seems, represents such a direct challenge to the status quo, while at the same time evoking such deep yet ambivalent affection. What does this mirror voice have to say? To get a sense of the content, 
but even more the specific sensibility that marks songs bearing the chop or seal of such a saint, we would need to map the contours and boundaries of the vast territory of song attributed to her across the centuries. Only then can we begin to isolate something of the timbre of her voice and the themes and images associated with her, as well as the subtle and not so subtle ways these may shift with changing times and circumstances and with their social, religious, geographic, and cultural dispersion, translation, and circulation. Only then can we begin to see the points of identification and motivation that may lead people, so many people, to speak this voice and to understand the ways in which they have done so. In the time I have, I'd like to introduce you to some strains of Mira's voice, not always included elsewhere, sung outside the halls of the literary academy and of social, political, and religious normative constraints, as well as to a few of the popular songs that readily move across boundaries of difference in social positioning, region, language, and religion. Songs sung in Western Rajasthan by singers from communities deemed very low to mid-level in the former caste hierarchy on a continuum thematically with manuscript and print collections, but often also diverging significantly. Gone, for example, is the sharp distinction between sagun and nirgun devotion, that is, devotion to God manifest in form, in this case in the form of Krishna, and devotion to God as beyond or transcending form, characteristic of the Sikhs and saint poets like Kabir. Reference, references to God as the Satguru, or true guru, and to Raidas as Mira's guru abound here that are deliberately excluded in the later standard literary collections. And Mira often refers to her Lord as Ram, a generic and thus inclusive name for God, rather than the res restricting her references to names specific to Krishna. The religious environment of village, of village Rajasthan in which the members of these groups live is complex with influences from Nat and Nirgun traditions merging with devotion to a number of goddesses, manifestations of Shiva epic hero deities, and both Hindu and Muslim saints. Secret punts or, or paths with tantric elements exist side by side with Vaishnava practices and varied strands of Shia, Sunni, and Ismaili Islam. Ancestors are richly honored, and the presence of spirits and ghosts is acknowledged. Magic is said to be practiced for both good and ill, Possession is recognized, a recognized phenomenon, and shrines are visited with regularity. Add to this the many formal religious sects that thrive in Rajasthan, as well as the independent holy men and women with their devotees, and something of the intricate pattern of interweaving influences becomes apparent. Various caste communities have particular traditions, but there is much exchange as well. Mirabai fits quite comfortably in this complex and inclusive world. The actual number of Mira songs known to individual singers varies considerably, but it is the collective memory of multiple per performers and audience members that preserves the large repertoire of circulating songs. Singers constantly create new songs and learn from each other, with Jagran singing sessions serving as the classrooms and itinerant singers introducing material from other locations. Professional cast musicians are able to draw songs from written sources as well and set them to music, so the boundaries between written and oral traditions are very fluid. Audience members who may or may not themselves sing offer corrections and fill in lines when the singer's memories fail or introduce them to new renderings of songs, as do both professional recordings and singers' individual cassette recordings that they make. Songs, verses, and variants flow with the coming and going of ordinary people too, from pilgrims and travelers to migrant artisans and laborers, semi-nomadic herders, outmarried daughters to merchants operating in trans-regional networks. In examining the Mira songs of the, sung by these singers, we will of necessity be limited to freeze frames, their lively performance, ephemeral performance transformed into the stillness of text, and will be very limited at what we can look at in our short time. Among these repertoires, we do find renditions of some songs found in early manuscripts and later print editions sometimes in almost identical forms, other times with considerable variation, that speak of the depths of devotion. The popular song, Mira's Heart Repeats Ram, Only Ram, is sung, adding a verse asking who could refuse to water sacred tulsi or basil growing in the courtyard, a reference to Mira's childhood where it was said sacred basil grew around her. 
They add this to the usual one about the cup of nectar obtained through the recitation of Ram's name that similarly cannot be refused. The quintessential Mira song, um, There Is No Other, is also sung. But it is the name of Ram here, rather than Girdar Gopal, that is without compare. The version you see here is the one in the literary canon, uh, one that it suggests that all of this is after she's left her home as a widow. Um, there's another verse there that appears in many other renditions of the song where the second line is not about uh, sadhus, but she says very clearly that she is married to Krishna. So that one also gets left out of the canon. Further verses recount Mira's running to greet sadhus and receiving from them inner knowledge available only to a few. That doesn't show up there either. Mira buys Ram in a rendition of the familiar song, Mira, Mother, I Have Purchased Govind, and she sings of having heard that Hari is coming, news which sends her running to the roof of the palace to watch the road. Jogi, don't go, don't go, don't go, finds a place here the song you see there, with Mira declaring simply, I am yours, rather than I am your servant in the refrain. Speaking of merger rather than loving union with God and character characteristically addressing Krishna as a jogi or renouncer who seems, though at times to love her, at other times to be totally distant. So too does Mira's wedding to Gopal in a dream Though one rendition of the latter is quite different from those found in available manuscripts and printed collections, including many more details of an actual wedding, as in a traditional wedding song. The exchange of coconuts to seal the engagement, henna placed on the nails of the bride and threads tied on hands and feet, the bridegroom dressed in a traditional saffron robe and a five-colored turban. Love is an illness that the foolish doctor cannot cure by checking Mira's pulse. Only those also wounded could recognize the source of her pain. On the banks of the Yamna, she sings of bathing in the cooling waters and watching the beautiful Krishna in a version of this classic song. But there is also another set of related songs in which she sings as Radha on the river's shore, grown weary of offering herself there to Krishna, who seemingly has no appreciation for the gift. These more familiar songs blend with others that expand on themes only touched upon in the written, in written in written form recorded in earlier centuries, and alternate verses may give similar songs dramatically different meanings. In some cases also, songs clearly contain images from the 20th century or seem to be the creation of later skilled poets, drawing from the expansive pool of musical and poetic music mirror traditions and on the saint's authority. Many of the songs sung by these singers deal with the theme of love and longing, even as they do in other segments of the tradition. One family of songs rich in detail enumerates the lover's promised gifts to her beloved, if only he will come to her. Verses in which Mira promises to plant a garden with pomegranates and grapes, to build a palace and lay out a beautiful bed with cushions and pillows, to prepare a delicious meal and to make fine clothes for her dark lover, alternate with the refrain, live in my eyes for a little while, my amorous Ram, admiring Ram, Come and dwell in Mira's heart. In the final verse, she says that the charming Lord Mohan did indeed meet her and that her heart finds pleasure at the feet of sadhus. Singers from Sarohi sing of Mira promising to shower her dark lover with flowers, spread a beautiful bed in a cloud palace and cover it with blossoms. She will cook sweets, offer milk, him milk, make sweet kheer, and give him holy Ganges water to drink. Take me across the sea of existence, she cries. Krishna does come to sit in her home, placing his hand upon her head in blessing. And she knows that joined to him, she will indeed cross over. Others sing a similar song, adding to the list of things to be prepared, rice, dal, and bread. The domestic art of food preparation, including details about particular cows, the making of curds, etc., fill the verses in what seems a celebration of hospitality and the work of women's hands. A fitting gift to offer the Lord of the poor, who cannot but respond to the invitation set before him with such love. If he comes, Mira will offer all she can. Imaged in the beauty of sensual pleasures, a palace, a beautiful bed with a promise of sexual bliss, 
delicious savories and sweets, a garden of flowers and fruits, fine clothes, all made by her own hands. And he does come. Similar listings in women's songs, some occur in women's songs, sometimes to show all that a woman has made, but that a husband or lover refuses or has abandoned, at other times, as here, to entice him to come and to honor him when he does. Women sing of Mira planting a garden for her dark lover with mangoes and bananas. The mangoes are ripe, but who will taste them? Mira's Ram has gone into the forest. How long will she stand waiting at the feet of God? How long will she stand singing bhajans? She churns butter from milk, sweetening it with sugar, but to whom will she give it? She makes a meal with savory dishes, but who will eat it? Who will sleep in the beautiful bed she lays out, and who will bathe in the step well she builds? All these questions are again addressed to Dinanath, the lord of the poor, an epithet much less common in manuscript and print collections. Yet her questions go unanswered, and in the end, as in the beginning, Mira stands alone singing. In this song, expressing the pain of separation rather than the joy of union either anticipated or fulfilled, and echoing more ordinary women's songs of longing for a husband laboring far from home and inverting those in which she asks her lover to give her these same items as a gift in a testament to his love. Just trying to follow my time here. Okay. As in other collections of Mira's songs, Viraha, Love and Longing in Separation, in separation has a prominent place in the songs sung by these singers and is an effect of human life. If God is all in all, we're part of God. But for love to be possible, we must be separate. So that condition is paradoxical, but present. A typical song articulates Mira's pain when her divine lover seemingly doesn't come. You do not come, dark lover, nor do you send a letter, O king, teasing you make an offer, but when I reach out, you always pull back. Someone tell me, is my dark lover coming home? These two eyes won't listen to what I say, overflowing like rivers in the monsoon rain. Someone tell me, when is my dark lover coming home? Among my companions, you are my best friend. Give me wings so that I can fly to him. By Mira says, my dark lover is the one who raised up the mountain. I, his servant, find delight at Harry's feet. Someone tell me. The thematic continuity between this song and the manuscript and print collections is clear as Mira speaks poignantly of the unfulfilled promise of encounter, her unruly eyes streaming with tears, her longing to be able to fly to her Lord and her delight in being at his feet. Another verse is added by other singers. Before whom can I speak my innermost thoughts? There is no one else I can tell. A deep personal anguish and the terrible isolation of being constrained not to speak of it for whatever reason finds voice here, as does the impassioned longing of so many young women forced to live apart from husband or lovers by circumstances beyond their control or those for whom marriage has brought no such love or fulfillment. In another song of Iran and Longing, common also in the print collections, Mira speaks of the dangers of such a love. She is wounded so deeply that she's in agony, unable to eat or sleep, wasting her life and weeping. If only she had known, she would have gone to every corner of the city and told everyone she met not to fall in love. Wasting away in her longing for God in another song, she is as one addicted to opium, a, co a commonly used drug in rural India whose addictive nature is well known, but which provides a po powerful palliative to chronic pain and parasitic dysentery, sometimes imbibed collectively along with tea in preparation for the backbreaking labor of the day. In this song, the withdrawal, of sympt the withdrawal symptoms rack the singer's body and her whole attention is driven to focus constantly on obtaining this drug at the cost of all else. I am an addict of Hari's name. When the craving comes, how can I satisfy my desire? When it grows, what drug can I take? When it grows, I take the opium of Hari's name. Just as, the, as an acrobat on a tightrope keeps her eye on the rope as her partner plays the drum, so the people of God cross over. Like a water carrier who has filled her pot and placed the weight on her head, though she laughs and talks, she cannot forget the pot 
as she walks. The opium-filled mind believes it controls the elephant. Give me the goad, brother, intoxicating me. Mirabai sings praises. Give me the goad, brother, let's go. Mirabai sings praises. What can be done with such addiction? When it grows, I take the opium of Hari's name. The word translated here as people of God is Harijan, also used by Gandhi, among others, as an alternative to the pejorative label untouchable, though equally a castless term indicative of the equality of all before God. The song invokes familiar images, the traveling acrobats and lively chattering women walking back together from the well. Only with such desire and such all-consuming concentration can one make one's way safely through this world and cross over. Yet this opium is also intoxicating, a pleasure which leads to ecstasy and excess, far surpassing that of any ordinary drug and equally irresistible once the addiction takes hold. At other times, however, the ways of God are beyond human understanding, generating bewilderment rather than ecstasy. If Krishna does indeed have great compassion for his devotees, then why does he seem so indifferent at times to their call? Dark lover, yours is a strange sporting game. Some places you come, dark lover, without being called. Some places it seems you've forgotten the world. Some places, dark lover, rain falls and scattered droplets. Some places you send inundating floods. Some places, dark lover, you make level with plains and ponds. Some places you stake out for the palaces. By Mira says, her lord is the gallant mountain bearer, carried away in the surging flood at Hari's feet. I am carried away in the surging flood at Hari's feet. The song suggests not only the paradoxical nature of existence, but also a familiarity with the suffering caused by drought and flood. The game cannot be reconciled with compassion and justice, either in scarcity or abundance. Those who lack the rain are as deserving as those who receive it. Mira no more worthy of the grace of God's presence than the flood that floods her being than the next person. And what of those swept away in the worldly floods? Truly, it is a peculiar game, this Leela, this play of the divine that is manifest existence. Yet humans also approach the ga game with confusion, looking for the wrong things in the wrong place and hope hoping to reach the goal without effort. Your beloved is in the palace. Why do you roam outside? Sesame oil is extracted from seeds. Without crushing, how can you get the oil? Ghee is extracted from curds. Without churning, how can you get the ghee? Pearls come out of the surging sea. Without the jeweler, who will judge their quality? By Mira says, my dark lover is the one who tore the mountain from its moorings. I met my dark lover, Ram having offered him my head. What you seek lies within like a pearl, not outside, but this treasure nevertheless cannot, can only be attained through disciplines of crushing and churning and properly valued only with the cultivation of discernment. No easy path, this bhakti. It requires the willingness to work and ultimately to sacrifice all else. In another song, Mira seems to challenge the true self not to leave the company of saints in its pointless wandering. Why wash your clothes in filthy water when the step well of nectar lies within? Life is short. If you miss this chance, you will weep. She assures her fellow travelers and herself as well in a song that could almost as easily be attributed to Kabir. Elsewhere, she suggests that the bhakti path is like walking on the sharp edge of a sword. It is not a game for the faint hearted. Still other songs elaborate on the lotus centers of yogic practice. Such encouragements and ponderings about the nature of the bhakti path are left behind elsewhere in lyrics that move into the realm of an inner devotion which simultaneously embraces the cosmos. Mira sings of the immensity of her love in the rough voice of a jogi man of Banswara, or alternately, he sings of his own deep love in her voice. The whole earth is my skirt, the high sky my head covering, 900,000 stars adorn my limbs. I will remain a while in this world. I play with the great king, the earth my blouse, my royal ornaments. I play with my brothers, I wander with sadhus. I enjoy such sweetness with my king. The moon and sun adorn my heart. 
The King Cobra's hood is entwined in my hair, the cosmic serpent my braid, my mantle tied behind. The breezes move like a fan as I walk the narrow mountain paths. The protective marriage thread has been tied. I will remain behind in this world. All the rivers of the earth throw, flow from my eyes. I make you pledge your love before the people. The ocean, the seven seas are filled with cupped hands. I drink and then come. I decorate my sari with a second satyr and I wear my heart as a flower garland. With two hands joined, Mirabai speaks. We will meet in the immortal realm. Among those songs, these songs sung by lower caste singers, we also find many that defiantly address the Rana. The Rana is clearly Mira's husband in most cases. In these songs, she rejects both the marriage and everything for which the Rana stands. She is wife only to Krishna, and she is neither dignified nor demure. Instead, she is a woman of passion and strength who chooses to renounce her life of privilege taking up voluntarily a life of poverty and embracing a low caste guru. Raidas is a central figure in many songs and is guru to the mature woman as well as the child. Mira's association with him has serious repercussions and is a primary reason for her per persecution in addition to her breaking of caste-based gender expectations and associating with sadhus. Her suffering is intense and prolonged at the hands of the Rana and in the absence of her Lord. In such songs, the Rana is clearly not only the husband of the saint, but also emblematic of other Ranas. In Mewar, both tribal and low caste people suffered over the centuries under the rule of the Sisodia Ranas, who demanded from them forced labor and various other kinds of tribute. Though sometimes referred to as Kumbarana in these songs, the fact that the Rana is most often not named beyond his identification as the ruler of Mewar or of Udaipur and as a Sisodia Rajput, leads Parita, Parita Mukta to assert that the critiques voiced in the songs extend to a general condemnation of Rajput feudal authority. At another level, all those of higher caste who would oppress and humiliate those of lower caste in myriad ways also partake of the identity of the Rana. Madhu Kishvar and Ruth Benita suggest that this lack of specificity allows him to be equated with any figure of authority, leaving the figure open to more diverse interpretations. The Rana's persecution of Mira is a popular theme, and Versons often move through each murder attempt in turn. A jogi singer performing among the tribal beals of Banswar sings of an episode of the poisonous snake in, in more detail in the following song. Um, one of many with the frame, what can the Mewari Rana do? Rana gave a cup of poison into Mira's hand. She has put her faith in Hari. Take her hand, don't delay. What can the Mewari Rana do? Go into the jungle and catch a snake. Take a basket, Rana Ji. Take a basket entwined with flowers. Give it into Mira's hand. What can the Mewari Rana do? When she opened what was given, it was a snake charmer's cobra. Her faith in Hari, you know, Raghunath, she has placed her hands in yours. Putting the black snake round her neck, act quickly, O oh snake. Her faith in Hari, she wore a necklace, a necklace of gold. Mira met her guru, Ravidas the Chamar. What can the Mewari Rana do? Here the snake is not a wild cobra, but that of a jogi snake charmer, and thus will not hurt Mira, though she willingly puts it around her neck. Her guru is also specifically identified as a Chamar, a caste community formerly identified as untouchable leather workers of the very lowest status. The emphasis in the song is not on Mira's Rajput identity, but rather on her affiliation with jogis and Chamars and their protection of her against a common enemy. Whatever the Rana does turns to be a blessing, turns into a blessing for her, though that through their intervention and that of God, subverting his intent. A second jogi of the same region sings of the Rana's impotence in the face of Mira's devotion in another song from a similar family of songs sung to a popular dance style. The company of sadhus is dear to me, my mother. What can the Mewari Rana do to me? Expenses and necklaces do not suit me, Rana. The Tulsi Mala is dear to me, my mother. What can the Mewari Rana do? Keep the Kajal and Tilak for yourself, Rana. The ash of the sacred fire, the Duni is dear to me, my mother. What can the Mewari Rana do? And here she's rejecting all the things that usually are signs of a happily married woman, things a man wants to give 
uh, to um, his wife and what she wants to get from him. Um, but what can he, she do to her if, he rec if she rejects all the things he offers? She embraces the life of a renouncer and all the things accompanied by that. She'll wear a, tul a Tulsi mala, characteristic of Vaishnava devotees, and tend the duni, a sacred fire associated with sh Shaivites, um, served by the Nath Jogis, the Dasnami Gosains, and the comrade priests of Ramdev, as well as Ramanindis and others. It has a political resonance among the Beals because of a, a revolt led by Govangiri, and because British agents sought to destroy Dunis in an attempt to stem the tide of political activism that was inseparable from Bhakti in this movement. The service of the Duni thus res resonates with political solidarity in the struggle for social liberation as well as shared religious practice. Mira addresses the Rana directly in this song, telling him to keep these things for himself, which have been gained through forced labor and the tributes of his low caste and tribal subjects in a politicized reading. Her rejection of him could not be more complete. In this context, her rejection appears as self-assertion rather than self-denial and constitutes a form of resistance, also mobilized by other women, particularly in situations of extreme subjugation. Through her actions, he is deprived of being able to shower his wife with the gifts that would mark her as a happily married woman and show off his royal excess, um, proclaiming his power over her and his subjects by doing so for all to see, even as she aligns herself with them and not with him. A number of songs carry the refrain also that Mira holds fast to renunciation. And here's an example of one of those songs. I'm gonna not read it to you so that it, because I don't wanna to take too much time. But the various things Mira rejects in this song are standard. It does mention motor cars. Um, those don't appear in other renderings of this family of songs, but they reflect a continuity of sensibility and build on the meaning of the other lines. And they show that Mira chooses to live as the poor live, walking from place to place, rather than traveling in expensive cars, a 20th century equivalent of other more timeless privileges. The singers are well aware that there were no motor cars in Mira's time, but such a verse brings the past and Mira into the present. She walks among her 20th century devotees. She rejectly, directly rejects her marriage in this song, running to the temple for refuge. She wants no part of it. In other songs also, they're marked with a common refrain tying Mir's renunciation to the rejection of her marriage. She sings, my mind clings to renunciation. I will not go to my husband's home, mother. I will not go. In these songs, her marriage is not glossed over as a happy but short period, as it is in some of the nationalist tellings, but a point of conflict in many songs, paralleling more ordinary women's songs that lament misguided parental choices and the like. In when one song she's called down to the marriage, she refuses to come. In another, she declares herself una unavailable and unwilling to cooperate. She says, Rana, why should I marry a bridegroom when birth after birth will die? I married the bridegroom Sham. Such a statement can also be read or heard as a critique against the ideology of widowhood that blames the wife for her husband's death, eschews remarriage for widows in many castes, and demands of them a forced renunciation or even that they choose to die with their husbands burning on their funeral pyres in a final act of virtue or sati. Just gonna skip down a little bit. In a song whose refrain is shared by many others, the performer sings. Oh, sorry, I guess I missed that one for you. Um, if the Rana is angry, he can keep his great city. Sorry. I knew I was gonna forget to advance this, so I apologize. Didn't let you read the songs. But here, let's go to this one. If the Rana is angry, he can keep his great city. If God is angry, where can I go? I sing the praises of Govinds. Keeping a fast is my custom. Every day I rise to go to the temple. I go to the temple and dance, bells ringing. I drive the ship of Ram's name across the sea of existence. Mira's lord is the clever one who raises the mountain, the gallant dark lover, Sham. Thinking it through, I make my choice. My joy is now complete. 
Ruts, vows involving fasting are a common element of women's religious lives and find a place here along with daily visits to the temple. Mira braves the Rana's anger in order to cross over, exercising her own judgment about how she should act. And here she does not passively ask Krishna to take her across, but declares with clarity and strength that she will drive the ship herself, having thoughtfully chosen this course and actively pursuing it. Other women too can do the same, following her example. The breadth and popularity of Rana songs and the creativity attested to by the incredible number of variations on the theme that are found in the repertoires of these singers suggest that they offer a language particularly suited to articulating the truths of multiple singers' experience. The use of specific caste names for low caste characters within the song, the association of Mira with practices from their religious milieu rather than the more restricted Vaishnavism of the literary canon, and the emphasis on her vehement renunciation of all things unavailable to more ordinary people, most especially to the low caste and the poor, shows Mira as one who inhabits the worlds of the singers themselves and is a devotee of Dinanath, the lord of the poor. Her voice speaks in the grammar, images, and melodies of familiar song traditions in the vernacular of everyday struggles and joys, authorizing and inviting others to speak of love and longing, of hypocrisy and cruelty, of hopes and dreams, of suffering and sorrows, of hard-won wisdom, and of the world as it is, but also as it should be. And resistance in her songs offers what Lila Abu Lagod has called a diagnostic of power, not merely painting romantic possibilities of a better world, but instead naming sites of oppression and negotiating multiple and often coercive relations. Mira dares to challenge the ways of the world, dares to live a life of dignity and beauty, dares to give voice to her own thoughts and desires, but she does so not as an isolated individual from the past, but rather in dynamic relationship with those who speak her voice, brought to life in the participatory realm of performance and in their simultaneous assertion of their own right to speak and to choose whom they will be and how they will live. By now it is clear that what is going on here is far beyond the simple transmission of song texts from a saint of the past, nor was that even the situation in Mira's time, it seems. It's unlikely she even performed her songs in the same way all the time. People perform received Mira bhajans, bringing them to life and relishing the emotions and beauty of the songs and adding to the traditions through improvisation, expansion, and innovation, even as hagiographers and others did with her story. Others come to recognize their own experience in her songs and find their own voices in speaking with her voice, even to the point of consciously composing in her name. Still others may enter even more deeply into her life, falling in love with her story and songs, then identifying with her more fully, trying on her character, imagining her thoughts, feeling her emotions, sharing her experiences, even to the po point of becoming Mirabai, at least for a time and finding or crafting their own identities through hers. And so we must speak of Mira's collective voice, of co-creation or co-authorship, and of linguistic and cultural translation. At these levels of engagement and all these levels of engagement and experience contribute to this collaborative and intersubjective voice, with the participants and the saint continually transformed in the process, for Mira's voice belongs to the confluence of individual and collective memory and imagination existing in the lively space of interrelationship. And as such, it is constantly being reshaped with every singing always already an interpretation. Speaking this voice requires the active infusion of meaning, but also elicits interrogation and playful reworking of meanings, the meanings encoded therein. Singers contribute to meaning, making, meaning making in multiple ways as they enliven her voice in song but also through conscious reflection, discussion, and composition. Performers and translators do the same as they seek to understand and br then bring her speech alive in other languages and other cultural and religious contexts and times. Some will move further into interpretation, weaving together song with teachings and kirtans and katas, or selecting songs around particular themes for performance or print. 
devotees, scholars, and a multitude of others, each with their own agendas and communities, will also speak of rather than in Mir's voice, adding their characterizations, collections, and analyses as they too actively participate in the creation of both speech and meaning in Mir's voice. And though some may try, Mir's voice will prove no easier to pin down or rein in than her story. In recombining or expanding verses from various songs or drawing on common standard phrases and images, subsequent singers themselves may not necessarily have considered their improvisations to be particularly original. They were, after all, singing in what is recognizably Mir's voice and sentiment. Some compositions may reflect an affection for the saint, in a way paralleling the expansion of narrative traditions of her life, where creative engagements becomes a way to relish and extend the enjoyment of the sensibility of the voice and all that it makes possible to speak. Every slight change can add delicious shades of new meaning, as Shama uh, Futahali observes. For example, when a single vowel changes clouds into droplets of rain in alternate re renderings of a song, the sheer abundance of renditions of related songs, even in print collections, much less in the repertoires of singers, confirms this creative license and mode of participation, as do the expansive families of song, whether they're Rana songs or Jogi songs of, or songs of longing and participation. Singers may also quite consciously compose in Mira's name to give authority, weight, and context to their own works, as Jack Hawley has noted. They may do so with confidence and in affection for and imitation of the saint as their own creativity and devotion are awakened or more humbly to give expression to their own inner spiritual experiences validated in the moment of recognition in Mira songs. Others may compose in Mira's name in order to speak the truth, exposing bankrupt social and religious hierarchies and the violence they perpetuate and defying established norms and practices, when to do so in their own voice would open them to the same murderous rage that Mira faced, drawing on the saint's authority to validate the truth they speak. Or they may do so to speak aloud otherwise unspeakable emotions and experiences of more impassioned but forbidden human loves and longings, or of familial abuse, or agonizing loss or loneliness, feelings and experiences might, that might find their way into words only in another's, and specifically in Mira's voice. Or they might do so as the first step in daring to desire and to speak at all, to sing I, when to do so in their own name and voice is not yet conceivable. Such active participation and collaboration is the hallmark of Mira's voice. Thank you. We now have a few minutes for a question and answer. Please raise your hand and Isabel or I will come to you with the microphone. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was just wondering, I know that a lot of the songs that you presented um, have been maybe intentionally excluded from the canon of Mira Bhajans for, a vari for various reasons. But I was wondering if there are any recordings of these songs. There actually are. Um, many of the songs are available through a folklore institute in Rajasthan called Rupayan Sanstan. And they have them all on CDs that you can order. They're beautiful. The singers are amazing that I've drawn these songs from. So you can get them there. There were some commercial recordings that came out in 1993. I don't know if they're still available commercially, um, but definitely you can find them. Thank you. Should be able to find them also on some, um, if you go online, you're likely to pull up something for Rupayan Sanstan. And if you're interested, I can give you my card. You can email me and I'll give you the, the, the names to look up. Um, my question is regarding like Mira's voice in um, contemporary India. I can see how the songs um, that go against like caste order and social order. I do know, um, and but I'm not familiar with um, lower caste Rajasthani singing these verses, which speak against social order. So I guess my question is, what does Mira's what, what does Mira say in like upper classes? What does her bhakti look like in upper classes in contemporary India? Like how do they 
use this bhakti to maintain social order, but still like give Mira's voice to it? Okay, usually the way this is done, the, the version that you would read in school is usually drawn from Chaturvedi's collection. And that one is, all the Nirguna references are removed, so it's very Vaishnava, but it's all songs about, there are lots of songs about love of Krishna, about Vrindavan and the leelas of Krishna, and, and songs of love and longing. And there are, all those songs are there, and they're framed by a story of Mira that is the ones put out as the history of Mira, but it can be traced to the last century of the 19th century. And in that story, they say she was a good wife, and she did everything she was supposed to do, but then her husband died. And her father-in-law died, and her father too. And at that point, she turned to devotion. So by framing it in that way, then the songs that she sings can be understood to be the words of a, a widow. And then when she renounces things, or she says, Krishna's my all in all, that's not a problem. It's actually appropriate for a widow to do, to turn her life to devotion at that post-marital stage. So then she doesn't, she's not so unacceptable, not so rebellious. She's still, you know, she can, you can always hear a song in a different way and sing it with a little bit of different emphasis. I went to a temple in, in Jaipur, and I was, I was there with a woman leader who was from a mid-level caste, Vaisha caste, and she asked the women to sing a song for me, and they all got up and immediately started singing a Rana song about Rana, I don't like your country, and they did it with great big smiles and they got up to dance because there was nobody in the temple but women at the time. And you just got the feeling that they were kind of just having a lot of fun with it and thinking, you know, hey, I'm here at the temple, I got away from my Rana for a little while and making a kind of, just making it amusing in that sense. So, I mean, women can identify with this at other levels too without having to think that Mira does this. And, and mo those, the official version of Mira's life also denies that she had a low caste guru. So you get rid of some of those caste issues that way. Sorry, one more question. Um, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on um, kind of the third person references that Mira makes to herself. Um, and I, I've noticed that in some of the songs that I've heard and it's like there's, there's an example there too on the board, on the, well. Yeah, um, there are a number of songs like that. There are some songs that are just about Mira straight out, and then there are some songs that are just in that I voice, and then there are some that have that speaking in the third person. And because it's a composite tradition, probably those verses were maybe spoken by someone else, but it's also this song tradition is kind of on the cusp between epic tradition and it's on that edge, and the epic traditions, they speak in the third person in that way the epic song traditions of Mira. So it's kind of a, a mid-range form in the first place. And, and that's Jack Hawley's observation, um, not mine. But so you get a kind of a whole continuum between songs that are about Mira and songs that are in her voice and some in the middle that kind of cross over. She could speak in the third person of herself, you know, too, but we don't know, you know, whether she said what she said, actually. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was just wondering, there seems to be like an air of mysticism around Mira and her story, you know, the whole, um, the snake turning into a garland of flowers and thorns on her bed turning into a bed of rose petals. Um, it's just like a commonly told like folktale that I grew up listening to. And I was wondering, what does this mysticism, what effect does it have in the retelling of Mira's story? And um, the image of her is more of a symbol than as, as, as a historical figure. Um, well, the, the, the sort of scholarly study that's informed by a, a more, for lack of a better word, sanitized view of Mira, will say that people made up those stories just to add miracles around her. But there's a historian, Herman Goetz, and, and also some of the earlier people writing in the Hindi literary community about her, they would say, well, she obviously had some allies in the palace. And even the song about this, it was a snake charmer's cobra that's in the basket suggests that. So Herman Goetz will say, well, you know, the, she had allies in the palace that protected her. They switched the poison for harmless stuff before it got to her, maybe the person that was supposed to be carrying it. They switched the snakes for harmless snakes. So you can, 
you can look at her life without the miracles or you can look at it with them. There is another version of Mira's story that's just full of miracles. But when her story gets told in that way, it's usually she becomes such an exceptional person that you couldn't, she couldn't, you couldn't possibly be like her. And the story is often told where, here's what ordinary girls do, here was what Mira did. She was a great saint, that was good for her, but here's what ordinary girls do, that's what you should do. So it gets told in those kinds of ways. Please, please join me in one more time thanking Professor Martin. My pleasure, thank you very much for the opportunity.